This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, my name is Warren Allman. I'm the director of the Paleontological Research Institution uh, and the Museum of the Earth and uh, the, the co co convener of, uh, of Darwin Days, Ithaca Darwin Days 2009. Of course, this is a special one this year because it's the bicentennial. Uh, 48 hours from now is the bicentennial of Charles Darwin's birth. Uh, and uh, I have a little bit, of, I'm also the moderator for this panel tonight, but uh, before I, I do that, um, let me do uh, a, a few advertisements and, and acknowledgments. Um, some of you will have heard this about two hours ago, so I apologize. Um, this is uh, the fourth uh, annual Ithaca Darwin Days. Uh, we've been doing this since 2006, and a number of people uh, m helped make this possible uh, financially. We don't, we don't spend a lot of money to do this, but uh, that little bit of money has to come from somewhere. And uh, it has consistently, for all four years, come from a, an alumnus of the law school, uh, Stephen Lowenthal, who um, is very dedicated to this cause, and uh, we thank him profusely. Um, uh, I also want to thank several units of Cornell who uh, you can imagine under the present circumstances that it's not, dif uh, not uh, easy to find um, money for extra things like this, but several units of the university, including ecology and evolutionary biology, earth and atmospheric sciences, public affairs, uh, and the Speakers Bureau, uh, all contributed to um, this uh, event this year, and we're very grateful to all of them. Uh, and uh, the uh, PRI staff uh, uh, do most of the heavy lifting on this, and uh, I appreciate all of their hard work. Uh, let me make a couple of advertisements here. If you don't have one, there are some of these cards in the back which have the schedule for the entire week. Um, if you don't have a card or don't want to get one, just remember IthacaDarwinDays.org or the PRI website, PRIWeb.org, uh, has all the events. It is, as far as I can recall, Tuesday, and so uh, that means there's plenty more to come this week. So I just draw your attention to uh, tomorrow. Um, the name David Campbell may not be familiar to you, but he is a, um, a, a very well-known school teacher, high school biology teacher in Florida, and he's a Cornell alumnus, class of 77. Uh, he's one of the leaders of the anti-creationism uh, response among Florida public school uh, teachers and administrators, and so he will be speaking and participating in a panel discussion tomorrow, uh, which I... Uh, are, heartily encourage you to uh, to come and attend. He's already, he, he came in today and told me about new things that have just happened in the last week in Florida, uh, n most of them not very good. So um, uh, please come to those. Then Thursday, uh, and I should mention, um, uh, former President Hunter Rawlings will be introducing uh, David Campbell uh, tomorrow afternoon. Thursday we have a lecture on religion and evolution by Ross Brand, professor of Near Eastern Studies at Cornell. And then uh, one of the main events of the week, President Emeritus Frank Rhodes, who in a previous life was uh, a paleontologist and then in a, another previous life was, uh, was and still is a, a Darwin scholar um, and is going to give, uh, I think, a not to be missed lecture uh, on uh, 20 or 30 years of studying Charles Darwin. And then right after that is going to be the opening of what really is special this year for Darwin Week, uh, the opening of the Cornell half of a special temporary exhibit uh, called Darwin After the Origin. You all know Darwin wrote The Origin, but he lived another 20 years and wrote another shelf of books. And uh, this exhibit, which is at Kroc Library and at the Museum of the Earth, celebrates and, and uh, explores the books that he wrote after the origin. So the opening of the Kroc half of that will be on uh, Thursday afternoon. And then on Saturday, Darwin's birthday party on Saturday night. Uh, at the museum, tickets available at the back uh, or at the door, um, complete with cake and entertainment and lots of uh, uh, unexpected surprises. Earlier in the day, family day at the museum, if uh, we don't do a lot for, for, for small children and families during the week, but we make up for that on Saturday, so uh, snakes and, and other uh, accoutrements on Saturday are promised. Um, and if you don't want to go to family day, uh, come here, uh, Don Prothero talk at 445, 4.30. Um, uh, Don Prothero is a very well-known vertebrate paleontologist from Occidental College in Caltech, and he's just published a, a terrific new book on fossil evidence for evolution, uh, which is a great read. Uh, so there's plenty. Um, oh, forgot one other new thing. Um, this year we asked some local um, 
I guess I can say celebrities, some local notables and, uh, and, and faculty and, and other people to respond to a series of questions and we are posting them on uh, the Darwin Days website. Um, and they include the, the lead singer for Bad Religion who also got his PhD in zoology at Cornell. Um, uh, we, the uh, president of Cornell, um, uh, Professor Robin Davison, um, a couple of Cornell trustees, all responding to questions about evolution. So we're posting a few of those every day on the uh, website in a blog format so you can write in and say that you don't like bad religion if you want to. Um, so uh, with no further ado, let me introduce our distinguished panel today. And it is a very distinguished panel. It is a very eclectic panel and that's on purpose. Um, but uh, they are all very, uh, very distinguished. Um, on my far right, your far left, is Professor uh, S. James Gates, uh, who is the Toll Professor of Physics at the University of Maryland. Uh, he um, comes to us this, uh, to this event this year uh, courtesy of Cornell United Religious Work. Thank you to them. Uh, he gave a, uh, a wonderful lecture uh, in Sage Chapel on Sunday night, and he agreed to join us on this panel. He is an expert in string theory, uh, and uh, he has, uh, and which is really cool, but what really is particularly engaging about him in, the, in this context is he is one of the major um, popular speakers around the country and, and outside the country in explaining physics to popular audiences. And he's appeared in a number of television documentaries about that, and he's, he's very, very good at that. Um, Will Provine probably doesn't need uh, any introduction to many of you. Will Provine is more or less the co-inventor of Darwin Days at Cornell um, and uh, is a uh, evolutionary biologist and historian of evolutionary biology uh, at Cornell. He is currently the Tisch Distinguished Professor, um, which allows him to do what he does um, even more of the time. Um, and uh, to my immediate right uh, is Dr. Kenneth Kennedy, who um, despite all appearances is retired, uh, but uh, he is uh, Cornell's uh, physical anthropologist, um, has taught human evolution here for many years, continues to teach human paleontology and human evolution even though he's retired. Um, and uh, we were just talking that Cornell is going to have to figure out what to do about that when, uh, when he finally decides to really retire. His expertise uh, covers the waterfront as we're going to hear a little bit about tonight, but uh, most recently he published a great big thick book on the paleoanthropology of Southeast Asia. So he has... Uh, South Asia. South Asia, yes, sorry. Not to be confused with. Um, and uh, so his, uh, uh, he's, a genu he's the genuine uh, article in terms of being a physical anthropologist. The, the panel, uh, this idea for this panel was consistent with the notion of this whole week. Uh, a couple of, of the previous Darwin weeks here we have picked a theme to try to encourage people to come back if you came last year. Um, this year, it being the bicentennial, uh, we thought we would not pick just one theme, we would try to attract uh, the broadest possible audience by trying to cover almost every subject which, uh, that evolution touches on, which is impossible, but we tried to pick um, uh, topics that we thought would generate uh, a lot of interest. And so we picked the obvious biggies, creationism and religion, um, at teaching evolution, but we thought that we would uh, assemble a, a, a group to talk about the uh, potentially interesting topic of race and evolution. And when I solicited these folks to participate, I said simply come and say whatever you think is important about those two words. Um, I, I, prompted them a little bit further by saying, if you want to think about it, what, if anything, uh, does Darwinian evolution have to say about human races? They may or may not say anything in response to that, but they may. Um, why are we doing this? If, if, you're, if, if you're here, you're probably, you pr I probably don't need to, to, to answer that, but uh, let me just point out a couple of really interesting things that make this topic perhaps uh, particularly uh, apropos right now. Um, it's worth remembering that it wasn't so long ago that, that race was a completely legitimate uh, biological subject uh, taught in anthropology classes and evolution classes and, and uh, all kinds of classes. When I was an undergraduate, which admittedly was a while ago, um, I was very puzzled with why we talk about human races in one way and we talk about subspecies in another way, and I've heard that birds have races, and I've heard that people have races, and I've heard that Neanderthal is a subspecies, and so how does that all work? And the answer, of course, is that it was all muddled up anyway. Um, 
now race is, is not a very common word in mainstream biological science. Uh, yesterday in the panel on the life sciences and evolution, uh, Steve Kresovich, who's the vice provost for life sciences, uh, tried to steal a little thunder from tonight by asking his panel, what do they think about human race? And um, the responses were, were uh, brief and unanimous among the biologists that were assembled, which is, we don't think about it at all uh, from an evolutionary point of view. Uh, it, it is, it, one of the panelists yesterday said it's a non-subject uh, as far as biologists are concerned. Well, of course, it's not a non-subject uh, as far as non-biologists are concerned. Um, uh, and you all know, um, uh, you can all pick your favorite or least favorite example of that. We supposedly just elected a non-racial black president. Um, we, uh, Thursday is the is the 200th birthday, of course, of also of Abraham Lincoln, but I just learned that it's also the 100th birthday of the NAACP, um, which convened, I, I didn't know this until just this week, it convened, uh, it, it, it came out of uh, a discussion of what was called uh, 100 years ago, the Negro question. And that was a, not just a social or political question, but it was also a biological question. So um, it, it is not so long ago that that was, uh, part, uh, part and parcel of evolutionary biology. Um, so uh, with all of that as background, um, I want to throw it open to, uh, to these three gentlemen to say what they'd like to say. The, little, the format, such as it is, is that they're going to give brief statements of a few minutes and then entertain any questions uh, from, the, from the audience, and then we'll move on to the, to the next uh, speaker, and then we'll stay here afterwards as long as everybody wants to talk about it. So, Jim? Well, thank you. Um, on Sunday night, I indeed gave a presentation which uh, was the scariest presentation of my life because I am a physicist. And so I began the presentation by talking about three physicists, uh, the, probably uh, the three greatest physicists of all time, Newton, Maxwell, and Einstein. And I use Maxwell as a particular focus because Maxwell is the least known of the fathers of physics, but in some ways he's the most interesting if you ask questions about faith. He was a traditional, customary, devout Christian, and yet he's one of the three greatest physicists of all time. So what did he think about the issue of his faith versus his work? And so I thought that was a particular lens to work through in trying to address that question. And I would certainly uh, encourage others of you to look at the life of Maxwell if you're thinking about such issues. I think he has something to teach many of us. But of course, the other reason I chose those three is because ultimately they give my field a type of evolution. Cosmic evolution comes directly out of the work of these three gentlemen. The fact that as far as we can tell, our universe is about 13.7 13 billion years old and started with an event that we call the Big Bang and has been evolving ever since. I contrasted that with the work of Charles Darwin, the single father of evolution in biology. And I guess that just goes to show you that it takes three physicists to make one good biologist. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, Charles Darwin, of course, is a figure of much contention even to this late day and probably always will be because, because his work challenges us on very many levels. I'm sure you know the basic facts of his life. So he was born on the 12th of February in 1809, a birthday he did indeed shares with uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, he had a very long and su successful marriage to a devoutly Christian woman. Uh, in fact, her name was Wedgwood, as in the China, for those of you who collect such things. Now, we're all uh, pretty familiar with the Darwin story. Even as a young man, he started out somewhat as an adventurer with a five-year um, voyage on a ship called the Beagle. And this voyage took him essentially around the world. And um, he had the occasion to visit Brazil, in the, Bahia, uh, the city of Bahia, and to go inland. And there, for the first time, he actually saw the practice of slavery which I think made quite an impression on him. One of the comments he later made in life was that whenever he heard a human wail in misery, he always thought about the first time he heard such a wail, and it occurred when he went to Brazil. And he said, goes on to relate the story about how uh, some uh, slave, slave was actually being uh, disciplined for some infraction. And he said he thought it was the most terrible sound that he'd ever heard. 
He also went inland on that journey uh, in uh, Brazil, and not just to look at the the, the society, the slaves holding society, but also to do what naturalists do, which is to look at the flora and the fauna of the region. And there's this one beautiful quote that the 22-year-old Darwin made that I, I love and I'd like to relate to you. He said, I was led by feelings to the firm conviction of the existence of God and of the immortality of the soul. While standing in the midst of the grandeur of the Brazilian forest, it is not possible to give adequate idea of the higher feelings of wonder, admiration, and devotion which fill and elevate the mind. I well remember by conviction that there is more in man than the mere breath of his body. Now that's the young 22-year-old Darwin. But we all know, at least those of us familiar with the story of Darwin, that he winds up in a very different place at the end of his life with regard to religion. But one of the things that's, uh, to me, most interesting about Darwin is that he was a scientist in the way that I, that I admire all the workings of all great scientists. Namely, that they are led on journeys of discovery and they don't, they don't deny what comes out of that journey. In the case of Darwin, we know that he was, that his work in science ultimately does undermine his faith as a traditional Christian. And yet, even at the end of his life, I think some remnants, there's evidence that some remnants of that earlier Darwin was there. And uh, in fact, um, at the end of The Descent of Man, there's this wonderful quote about grandeur. He says, there's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few form, one, or even perhaps one. And that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to its fixed laws of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. One of his, near the end of his life, when he is dying, one of the things that he tells his wife is, God bless you. And so even though he is at the, some level rather agnostic in his belief, there's some residue there of a spiritual view. And there have recently, in fact, been books talking about Darwin that his uh, work as an abolitionist may have well-driven his, uh, his, uh, his views on evolution. I find that a little bit fanciful, but there are recent books to this, uh, to this point, and you may read them and judge them on your own. But what I say about, uh, what, uh, about Darwin is what I say about Einstein, is that these are people who are led by their science, and they don't deny where the science takes them. In the case of Darwin, of course, this five-year journey on the Beagle lets him have the opportunity to view many different life forms in various uh, settings. And it gives him, and he, Darwin, if you actually read some of the, the um, diary that eventually becomes his book, you find out that there's a keen observer that worked there, someone who notices details that perhaps most people would miss on a similar journey. And I encourage you to do the reading because it's actually kind of interesting. And so this very careful eye, which actually talks, for example, about the details of the social behavior in the societies around here, is turned on nature in the same sort of way in recording detail. And so what one gets the impression, at least personally, the impression I get about Darwin, is that he's a careful observer, a, a property that every scientist has to bring to the task of doing science. So when it comes to the issue of race, what, what, where does he end up? Well, let's first of all be very honest about Darwin. He was a, he was a man of his era. And that does not, so that does not mean that he had a kumbaya moment where he said, you know, we're all brothers and sisters and we will dance into the future together. That wasn't where he ended up on the issue of race. But what he did do is recognize the unity of the human race, that there, it's a singular noun, not a plural noun. And though he may have felt that European cultures and European people were the highest example of humanity, he understood that there was a connection between all of humanity. We are fortunate that we live in a time where the ideas of Darwin, in fact, have started to flower in a way that's quite unexpected. And I'm sure some of my other co-panelists will speak on this, particularly the co-panelists to my immediate left. But we live in a time where because there was a Darwin, we are able to look at our bodies and recreate the structure of the story of our species as we populated this planet.
It's a marvelous story that starts in East Africa, approximately 165,000 years ago. There are successive waves of migration that we can now track with our DNA telling us who went where. And the first Africans to leave the continent essentially wind up inhabiting uh, the subcontinent of India and follow that route among the, uh, along the North Pacific. The European branch of our family is actually very interesting, has a very interesting story, and I don't know how many of you know it, but the European branch of our human family also heads eastward until about 80,000 years ago when it decides to make a 180 degree turn and winds up entering, Asia, uh, entering modern Europe. And so without Darwin, this story of our connections to each other is not possible. And to me, that is one of the most wonderful gifts that science has given us in the last 50 or so years. Because science itself was used to perpetuate the myths of the, of the multiplicities of the human race. There was phrenology and brain cavity capacity and supposedly scientific studies which told us why we were different. And yet now, we find our science is turned around because of its inherent, uh, inherent error correcting mechanisms is telling us a different story. A story of a human family, a singular human family. And it's a story that we don't always uh, accept uh, so readily. So for example, when genomic studies started to tell this story, uh, there were debates about the singular origin of mankind or whether there were possible multiple origins. And so, for example, there were studies in 1998 asking the question, was, was, the, was the Chinese branch of the human family a possible separate origin place? We, are, those of us who follow such things, know the way that this story ends. All the evidence that we can get from, gen, from genomics tells us that we're all African. It's a very interesting point. The African peoples who survive today have the broadest genetic diversity in the genome. If people had left that group, you would expect that under those circumstances, the diversity in the genome is narrower, and in fact it is. So in fact, all of our science says, you know, precisely what our religions tell us, and what our spiritual and faith beliefs tell us, that we're actually brothers and sisters. And we're not so very far removed from each other. And to me, this is one of the greatest gifts that Charles Gar Darwin has left us. We may argue with him about religion, but the fact that he has told us in a very precise way how we are related to each other, I think is something that we should celebrate. And that's why I'm particularly happy to take part in this panel. Questions for Dr. Gates. Jean. Dr. Gates, it's interesting that the Church of England allowed him to be buried in the cathedral. Yes, well, um, Darwin was, Darwin's, if you look sort of at the totality of Dar Darwin's uh, interaction with society, it's actually very interesting because right after Darwin's uh, work appears, very quickly opposition and he was very much aware of the fact that people would interpret this as an assault on their religious beliefs. And yet he achieves great fame and honor in his life. There, have been, there has been a, a sustained period afterwards where Darwin, in fact, is not held in such high regard. And in fact, almost is ba banished from biology, but maybe I'm stepping on my, my colleague's story here, but is almost banished from, from biology. So it's not surprising to me that in his lifetime, his fame is sufficiently uh, great and his, the contribution that he has made is sufficiently uh, well known that this concession was made by the church. I think probably what's much, to me, the much more interesting thing was, in fact, uh, how he is able to animate his beliefs in abolition, because that's a really uncomfortable position, perhaps, uh, to hold at that time in society. But the church, indeed, made its peace with him in his time, in, well, at the end of his life. There are two hands. Yes, sir. Um, I, I saw your lecture on Sunday, and I was hoping to hear you say, how uh, Maxwell was influenced by Darwin and Ketterer, and especially um, how uh, Maxwell realized the threat to free will that Darwin and Ketterer posed, and his unsuccessful um, attempt to rescue the concept of free will. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, that's a little bit off topic from this panel, but I, I will say something. 
Um, Maxwell, of course, as I said, is one of the three greatest physicists that ever lived. And but he was all and though a devout Christian, he really didn't believe in manifest destiny. That in fact, that free will is also a in Maxwell's terms that free will is also a gift from our Creator. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's consistent with his religious beliefs. And but but the thing that Maxwell, I think, to me, the thing that Maxwell does most effectively. It's to try to put to rest this uh, idea that you can use science to justify religion. And to me, that's a much more important point, is that, you know, you can't, that science by, as you know I said on Sunday, science by its very design is incapable as a belief system for threatening religion. Now, the people who advocate both sides can attack each other, but if you actually look at the systems themselves, Science is actually incapable of attacking religion. And I can go into that for other audience members later. So um, Maxwell's, um, sort of Mac Maxwell's um, arguments about free will come out of this belief of, as, as both as a scientist and also as a, as a Christian. So he's being consistent in this uh, argument, but he's also saying don't use science against religion. And don't use science to argue metaphysical points. And the question of free will at that point in time is a metaphysical question. There was another hand in the back. Yeah, I assume that Darwin was deceased by the time of the rise of social Darwinism. I don't know. Maybe he wasn't. So what did he think about the use of his theory and application to society? I'm going to have, I can say some things, but I'm going to have to defer to other members of the panel on this. Um, he was not deceased by the, by the time that social Dar Darwinism arose. However, he is not the father of the idea either. That's a point of confusion. I mean, it's the name that's attached to the set of ideas, but he is not the father of these sets of ideas. In fact, one of his relatives were, if I remember my history correctly. So, um, I'm, sure we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to that question. Okay, good. And, well, let me, let me stop here then and, and maybe it would be more adequately treated by someone else. So let, let's hold off on that and perhaps one of my other one panel members. There was another hand down here. It's right here. Oh, yes. Now you've pointed out the impact of DNA on understanding race that we are really one people, as our president says. But now, how about brain imaging? Will that throw a light on spirituality perhaps? If I believe... Um, as Maxwell, and I do. You don't use science. Yeah, that's it. If you're asking questions about a physical reaction to spirituality, if that's your question, then yes, I can see how science is useful. But if you're asking a more essential question that we will ultimately understand why we're spiritual because of some set of physical observations, along with Maxwell, I don't believe that. I've had an average of two MRIs every year since 1995. They disagree with each other regularly, and they are nearly worthless for evaluating whether my tumor is growing or not. I do not believe that they are going to be able to analyze our spirituality with an MRI machine or a functional MRI machine. But they, but they found out that you didn't have that part of the brain that does spirituality. <laughs> you, can tell your, you can tell when your friends are on a panel. <laughs> she was. Um, okay, so let us uh, now move on with that to, uh, to Will Provine. When I came to Cornell, I had no doctorate degree, and I finished writing it the first year here. It was a history of population genetics, and immediately when I finished that over spring break, I started a new research project, which was the history of biologists' attitude towards towards race differences and race crosses. I started in on that research, and indeed I started with Darwin. And I found out that Darwin had a very uh, interesting view of human races. He believed they were all of one species, but they differed m mightily between each other. And he had a whole category, the lowest at the bottom. Get, take a guess. Do you think it's Fuegians? or Australian Aborigines? Which do you think? He saw them both. 
And in the end, he decided the Aborigines were the lowest because they didn't seem to ever be able to learn anything, even though they were very good at maintaining themselves out in the outback. Anyway, he had a whole hierarchy, and he believed that the races up at the top, intellectual races, were going to exterminate all the lower ones, and the example of the Tasmanians is one that he saw on the voyage of the Beagle. And he thought that would continue. His friend Thomas Henry Huxley was also, like Darwin, an abolitionist and believed that humans were one species, but he was absolutely clear in hereditary mental differences between African blacks and whites. He thought they were completely different in their abilities, and he said if the contest is held between blacks and whites, with minds, there's no question that the whites will win. If it's conducted by jaws, the blacks might win. And it goes on. The whole history of biologists' attitudes towards race differences and race crossing are just like this all along. I mean, people were as upset as they could be as biologists in looking at these questions, and they believed what their society was basically believing around them. So all they did was to take their biology and rationalize that with what they already knew anyway. Would you believe that when Mendelian inheritance is rediscovered, all you get is the same darn thing all over again, except now Mendelism supported the new kind of views about hereditary mental differences between human races. And Mendelism is used to argue against human race crossing. So in the early 20th century, you can look at the great summary of these in the 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1910 and 11. And I challenge you to look up the article entitled Negro and read what it says in the Encyclopedia Britannica. This was written by a physical anthropologist who knew just exactly what he was talking about, and I'll just let you take a look at that. But it didn't change then, and it didn't change all into the 1920s and 30s. The modern eugenics movement was just perfect for this. And to me, I began to get a little bit discouraged on this research project. So when Sewell Wright came along, and I saw this great evolutionary biologist, and I had a chance to interview him and write a book about him, I said, all right, I'm going to put that race book aside. And I'm going to go and work on that for a while, because it was a very discouraging story, and one that didn't change until after Nazi atrocities in World War II. That was a watershed period of time, but not an immediate one. It changes the minds of the older geneticists, not one iota. Not one iota, but it does change the minds of younger ones. And the younger ones then began talking about greater equality of races and so on. I'm thinking of particularly Leslie C. Dunn, a geneticist who worked at Columbia with Theodosius Dobzhansky. Now, what has happened to ideas about race among evolutionists since then? And the answer is unbelievable. Because, first of all, we get molecular biology. You can use that to deduce how long it was since humans uh, separated from chimpanzees. You can do it for now for Neanderthals. It's a grand thing. Now, if you use this kind of molecular technique, can you find out when all the variety of humans all over the world shared a common ancestor? And this is worked out in 1983, I don't know, 1987 maybe, something like that, in the 1980s. And the lab at Berkeley works out the most recent common ancestor by using mitochondrial DNA, which is just through the line of women. And they get a figure of 200,000 years ago. 
That was a, a, an amazing thing because it took what people were, thought were millions of years of differences between human races and crunched them all the way down to only 200,000 years ago. And that figure has come down by these same kind of gene genealogies to about 150,000 years ago. That's where we are right now with gene genealogies. When it's done on Y chromosomes, we do it through males. It started out around 175,000 years ago, and it's also dropped to around 150 or so in that neighborhood. Wow! So now we can see that we are all brothers and sisters, but it gets more interesting than that. What if you suppose humans have two parents and not just one. If you do it through the gene genealogies, you get a certain kind of answer. But if you do it through real genealogies, giving everybody two parents, you get a completely different view about how we have a most recent common ancestor. I've put up here on the board a place, if you copy that down, and enter that into your web browser, you will come up with a PDF of the article from 2004 in Nature magazine that has completely revised our ideas about when we share a most recent common ancestor by using the, the genealogy of humans actually having two parents. So when does this take place? When do we share a most recent common ancestor, everybody in the whole world. About 6,000 years, depending upon the model that they happen to use. And if you go back a few thousand years beyond that, everybody on Earth shares the same heritage from that point back in time. We are truly all brothers and sisters. And what I like about this is that I don't care. I don't give a hoot whether it turns out to be 6,000 years for the, for the most recent common ancestor. I don't care whether it's that or 20,000 years of what it is. It's nice at long last to have biology be on the right side. And it's taken a very long time for it to happen. And now, the job is to get this article widely dispersed, widely understood. And there's one interesting thing that the creationists will absolutely love about this. It's clear that the MCRA occurs in the last 10,000 years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions, please, for Dr. Provine. Yes. Well, that's a that's a very powerful message, um, and I'm glad you shared it. And Dr. Bates, I'm glad you shared yours. And you have the same basic point. My concern is sitting here. Let's say, um, is there some threshold? Let's say we did the same research and it was a hundred thousand years ago, or five million years ago. Is there some threshold where? it makes an ethical difference. And I'm starting to think now in terms of us and chimpanzees, as an example. Is there some I've point never, where the I've threshold never is? held the view that what's true of biology should determine my ethical views about race differences. It's not a biological issue whatsoever. We don't know anything about it what are the hereditary mental differences between racial groups and so on are. I suspect they're basically nothing now that we understand a little more about our phylogeny. But in any case, I don't think it depends upon the biology uh, on which I base my ethical view. My ethical view is everybody gets the same treatment, has nothing to do with biology. Absolutely nothing. So to me, I agree with your point, and I've argued that f for years and years and years. It's not a biological point. It's, a bi it's purely and simply a basic ethical point. It's a talking point. It, it, it's more than a talking point, Jim. May I, may I chime in on this Please. discussion? I think that uh, certainly as a physicist, when I look at this debate, and obviously as a human, so I take part in it from that point of view, but one thing that I, I, I always try to keep in the back of my mind is that we also have to be as brave as Darwin about this, and that is to follow where the data leaves us. 
And so if there are differences that are significant, we ought to be very honest about that too. Sure. But as my colleague Will just said, that should not be how we fix our ethics. Are you a vegetarian? I'm not. I feel just like Mr. Massimo Pigliucci this afternoon and when he gave his lecture. He said, you know, I really should be a vegetarian, but I love a good steak. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not a vegetarian, but I'm tending more and more in that direction virtually every year of my life. Other questions for Will? Will, what was Wright's position on, on race? I talked with him a good deal about that. He didn't agree with his colleagues who had more uh, of, a, of a racialist kind of view. He had his, his one of his teachers was Edward Murray East uh, at Harvard. And East was a very intense racist in his writings. And Wright clearly did not agree with that. On the other hand, Wright had a lot of sympathies for eugenics. And what we find of the, of the eugenics movement is that it gets up to World War II in pretty darn good shape. But after World War II, it wasn't popular to have the word eugenics in anything. So we get a, an American uh, human genetic society. We get all this sort of stuff, but no eugenics. And so eugenics has been basically pushed out of American society. And what's interesting is that under that situation, we've now got a powerful eugenics movement going right now. It's known as genetic counseling, and it's very powerful, and it's going to be more powerful in the future. What we have is a booming eugenics that's going to get more and more intense. Maybe we should think about that. That was actually one of the points that came up yesterday in the panel about the life sciences that it was called, yesterday it was called personal medicine. <laughs> uh, not my term. Gene, uh, go ahead. We all started uh, with a common ancestor. Yes. Biology can instruct us as to why we have races on this planet right now. Can you comment on why well, we have races? One thing that we know for sure is that Australia has had Aborigines there since uh, about 30,000 years ago, or maybe even longer ago than that. How could it be that they are part of this recent, uh, most recent common ancestor within the last 10,000 years? And the answer is there was so much migration of human beings that they are not separated biologically from the other human beings in Asia and so on. The rate at which humans spread across the Pacific Ocean is absolutely stunning. And all it takes is about 150 years for people to come across this, the Bering Strait and then go to the southern tip of South America. It's absolutely incredible how mobile we are. And everything that looks uh, like, gosh, these things are all completely permitted or something like that, it's not true at all. So the so-called different race that was in Australia was actually changing genetics back and forth uh, with different groups. And uh, the, I think the, the, the argument of a more recent, most, co most recent common ancestor is so strong, I can't get it out of my mind. I'm just thrilled. I thought you were going to go the other way and say that uh, uh, natural selection, perhaps, or environmental factors had an impact on why we have Asian Pacific versus Caucasian European versus Native American versus Aborigines, whatever. Well, there's no, there's no question that natural selection has acted on skin color, for example. That, no, no biologist that I know debates that. The question is, and we've known this since the 60s, that if that, and I'm, I'm surprised Will didn't say this, but one of Will's old professors got famous for doing this, Richard Lewinton, um, for 
demonstrating for the first time in the 1960s that there are no human races. And that sounds, that's a big surprise to people who are outside of biology, but in that, what that means biologically, right, Will, is that if you test people who we would call one race and we compare them to people of another race, there is far more variation within races than between races, and therefore that races was don't that exist. was Lewinson's very strong argument. Yes. So in that in that sense, what you but that doesn't remove the biology of humans or natural selection. It just means that what we see as skin color is only one tiny piece of this much larger puzzle. Um, okay. So uh, Kenneth, yeah. you're on. Thank you. I'm a biological anthropologist. I have done most of my field work uh, in paleoanthropology of India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, but I've also been very interested in the history of biological anthropology, uh, which goes back a few centuries. What I would like to clarify and uh, continue with what has just been said is the concept that the race concept, the, the traditional race concept, is defunct in science. It's not there. What happened? Well, let me give you a very brief background to that. It was in entomology and ornithology that biologists had trouble with the subspecies concept. They didn't disagree that birds or frogs or what have you, uh, were not of the same species, but there were differences within the species even though they might interbreed and have fertile offspring, but how do you account for those differences and how do you identify them with a name? Well, we go back to Linnaeus, and Linnaeus had no problems with that. In his early taxonomy, but particularly in the 10th edition of uh, his System of Nature in 1758, he listed a number of different groups of humans living, and decided that those were indeed races. So that traditional concept of race has been around for over 200 years. It's still alive and well. If you apply to Cornell University as an undergraduate, you're going to follow, or have to follow, the traditional race concept. Are you white? Are you black? Are you Hawaiian? Are you Native American? And so on. And you check the right box. Well, what happened is that we have a traditional concept of race that is essentially a social concept today. And I agree. If you compare uh, an Inuit, naked Inuit, with a naked Ituri Bambudi pygmy from the Congo, they look very different. And it's not unusual that people would say, well, I have to belong to different races. But what are we really looking at? Because races don't exist, according to scientists. And I'll go back to that point in a moment. But the thing is that what we're looking at is diversity of physical characteristics. And there are a lot of them. And most of my work has been with skeletal biology, but uh, I had courses uh, when I was a graduate student also in looking at differences in living human beings. Well, what actually has happened beginning in the 1930s was that ornithologists and uh, entomologists began asking the question about these members of an agreed common species who were different from one another but could interbreed and have fertile offspring. So what are we going to call them? This is the subspecies concept. And interchangeable with it have been um, ideas of varieties and breeds and so on. Well, they had a hard time describing that because they said, well, what if we find 60% of traits shared in common uh, does that mean that we now have the 40% that's left over a new race, even though they're the same species, but a race of the species, a subspecies? Well, the question came up, naturally, <laughs> oh, what if it's 59%? What do we do then? Also, it was recognized that the traits that we look at visually, 
or with instrumentation, x-rays, so on. These are arbitrary traits. They're selected. And skin color is a classic example because it's the most obvious thing. When you meet a person for the first time, your first concept is sex. I mean, not that you're obsessed with it, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you want to, this is a male or a female, or can't you decide? Uh, the next thing is essentially the stature of the individual, and the third thing is the skin color. Now, these are traditional concepts, but they're not natural concepts. They're not natural entities. Well, it wasn't until 1960 that a number of biological anthropologists, most of them still living, uh, went to a conference and talked to the ornithologists and the others who were having this subspecies problem. What do we call these subspecies? And what percentage of traits do they have to share or not share? Well, the anthropologist said, Glory, hallelujah. This is the same problem we have. This is exactly the same problem we have with human beings. We don't know what to call them. Where do you draw the line? Now, therefore, in, in that area of biology, it meant you can't use the concept of race in the traditional way. So what's happened today is that we have the concept of race, yes, existing in a traditional way, uh, in documents and census reports, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. has nothing to do with science, nothing to do with reality. And although it may be true that we're surprised by the range of differences, what we're forgetting is one simple fact. And that fact is that each trait that we decide we're going to use as a criterion for a racial assessment, is a gradient. That is, that trait has its own history and wanders around in space and time in different populations. Do you ever find a cluster of all these traits in one population? No, you don't. People thought they should find them, but they didn't find them. So we're looking really at separate traits that have their own, if you like, geographical history in their spread across time and space. And then we generalize where we see more of the same kinds of traits in higher frequencies in certain populations. And traditionally, we call those a race. So my position and that of my colleagues in biological anthropology, I don't even know any exceptions, is that the race concept is defunct in a scientific sense. But there certainly is tremendous physical, biological diversity in our species. And yes, we had a common ancestor that came out of Africa. And what is amazing to me is how quickly some of these gradations, some of these discrete traits and measurements and so on, spread so very rapidly. And the result of this is and this is my last comment, unless there are questions. Uh, the result of this is what we call the out of Africa hypothesis. And uh, I don't think we can disagree with that because certainly the earliest examples we find of anatomically modern Homo sapiens come from Africa and also from the Near East in Israel also. The alternative hypothesis is, yes, we may have come out of Africa all right, but very quickly, we began through adaptation, natural operation of natural selection, to see that some traits were more adaptive in given environments, which is a broad term, but in different ecological settings, of which uh, solar radiation is, is one, uh, but also the ability of certain plants for foraging, certain animals for hunting, and so on, and that these are all traits that, as I say, have their own history, but are found in greater frequency. Yes, sure, in some populations, but not ever 100%. So I think that anthropologists who are aware of biological anthropology would be in agreement with this today universally. There are exceptions. In Russia, 
uh, they have a racial classification that they believe is natural. Uh, it's not to say that individuals in our own population don't feel that the diversity they see is a key to something that is natural. It's natural only in the sense that there's diversity. It's not natural in the sense that it forms clusters and that those clusters can have a name. So the alternate has been, instead of using the old racial typologies like uh, oh, Dravido, Dravido Aryan, uh, Serbo uh, Australian, so on and so forth, uh, we refer to populations by their geographical location. And this is safe, and it's good, and it makes sense. Because at least we need to know what we're talking about. And the way to do that is not to use an outdated vocabulary, but rather to see where the geographical distribution is for these populations which are of interest to us. Thank you. Beautifully put. I should have kept my mouth shut. Um, OK, so let me uh, throw it open for questions to both uh, Kenneth and, and the whole gang. So. It was a question from a gentleman that I postponed. So if you could oh. ask your question again, maybe the panel can address it. What about social Darwinism? Yes. I think uh, Professor Provine may have uh, approached that because he suggested, I believe, that Darwin did uh, believe in gradations among human beings. There's no doubt. No, he did not believe in the great chain of being. That's a much older idea, and he rejected that, the idea of a great chain of being. But he was absolutely clear that there was a racial hierarchy among human races. When his cousin, Francis Galton, became the founder of eugenics and gave it its name, Charles Darwin wrote to him about it and said he was sympathetic. But he also believed that the lower classes in Britain were not keeping up on the having of babies. They weren't having, they were so unhealthy, they weren't having as many babies. So Darwin said, I don't see a real problem. I don't think we have to institute any eugenical rules. And Darwin never participated in that direction. But he told Francis, Galton that he was sympathetic to his idea of eugenics. Social Darwinism, though, is is somewhat different. Social Darwinism, um, I suppose, could grade into um, a racial discussion, but social Darwinism was um, an even broader concept of saying that um, basically, if if th those who are on top deserve to be on top by merit, and those that are at the bottom, however you define that, deserve to be there, and that, uh, as many of you know, was you, has been used in all kinds of different ways. Um, it, it, your original question, though, is, is uh, uh, important. Um, he did not coin the term, and it was coined before his death, and its peak was probably reached around the same time, uh, or around the 100 years ago for the, the, first, uh, the first centennial. Um, and today, it's actually, if you Google social Darwinism, you'll see that there's a fair historical literature on it still and what its implications have been. And only part of that, from my reading, is, is racial. It, it, yeah. you know, it trans, it's it's uh, industrial policy and immigration policy and all kinds of other things. Other questions for, yes, sir? Um, I was just wondering about the idea, like the, the, the race concept. And I'm certainly well familiar with the idea that there aren't any meaningful clusters of, uh, of traits, especially not that go along with, with, with skin color. I've heard some people discussing in a medical sense that there would be, might be some conditions that are more associated. Would that be more associated with specific geographical local populations? Or would that be more kind of, I guess, a statistical fluke? Like if you measure enough things, mm -hmm. statistically some things are going to be correlated with other things. So if you measure enough medical conditions, then just by sheer fluke some of them are going to be associated with race. As well yes. as uh, I can speak to that. Well, let's give an example. Uh, Tay Sachs disease is very common uh, of people of uh, Near Eastern descent, Jewish people particularly, and it's higher among them than among other populations, but it's not restricted to one population. Uh, the gradient that causes that has also been elsewhere and, and pops up. Uh, 
Uh, we can think of another example, a number of examples uh, where it's very hard to explain why they occur. Uh, big, thick brow ridges, which we associate with Homo erectus and to some extent with Neanderthals, uh, still occur in parts of the population. And a study that was done by my colleague, uh, Loring Brace, among Scandinavians, found big brow ridges among Scandinavians. I didn't tell them they were Neanderthals, of course, but uh, the point is that some of these traits were adaptive perhaps at one time in our biological history, and now they just hang around as genetic junk, but they still appear. So I, 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 I don't know of any traits that are so peculiar that they can be related just to one population. They're spread, but with different frequencies. That did come up yes in yesterday's panel with um, uh, uh, Carlos Bustamante and uh, 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 Andy Clark talking about, um, th again, this personal genomics that they see as the future of medicine um, when we are all, they were, they were talking, um, um, and I'm skating onto thin ice here by paraphrasing them, but they were essentially predicting that uh, rather than grouping people by races, not too long from now, uh, we will all be um, sequenced and uh, individually, and that will be the basis for, instead of saying, oh, you're white, we can treat you this way, we'll just say, here's your genome, and we'll treat you that way, um, <laughs> with all the potential negatives that that en en encompasses. But, um, uh, and that was their specific answer to that specific question yesterday. I think that there's some severe limitations to having our personal genomes. The reason why I say that is because if you have your personal genome, you don't want to share it with your life insurance company, right? But it turns out that it's no big deal for the following reason. When they trace diseases back in your genome, it's funny. They disappear on the way down to the genome. And you get four or five or six percent of the variation accounted for by getting to the genome. So it's, it says, what's happened to heredity for about these diseases? What's happened to heredity? It turns out that your genome won't be very much used to your life insurance company. What they're going to care about is what they've always cared about, your family history and things like that, which is much more telling than your genome. Don't worry about your personal genome. Forget it. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> um, well, Dr. Kennedy, uh, I remember taking your undergrad classes back in the 70s, and you were just as eloquent about these same topics then as, as you are now, and I appreciate what you had to say. I had a question for, I guess th there's four of you up there, you probably have four different opinions on this, and I know it's intentionally naive. So here, the racial concept is, in terms of biology, um, justly discredited. And yet, even today, people use it as their basis way, a basic way of Cordell, classifying admissions. Why? Is there, is there a prospect of change in that, and why does it continue? Well, I find with my students uh, when I talk about um, human diversity that many of them do uh, <coughs> believe in the traditional race concept. And uh, they may think of themselves as uh, having parents of different ancestry. In fact, the word ancestry is what we use more often because once you have a population geographical area uh, and you ask what their ancestry is, well, that gives you some idea, uh, but it doesn't deal with race. So I th I, I'm not sure I'm quite answering your question, though. Well, I guess, again, once again, uh, um, if the race concept, and, and I accept this notion, because um, I was well trained by you, um, if the race concept doesn't have a basis in biological uh, discrete units. No, that's right. It why not. is it continuing, and is there a future hope that it won't continue? Is it useful to people somehow? Well, uh, what continues is just... ...socioeconomic status. Yeah. Yes, that's and a fact. Cornell, in its admissions now, does not look just at race, but at parental education, rural, 
urban, single parent household, number of, of variables. As opposed, but race is something that the federal government requires of the university to get a sense of um, where the student population is coming from. But race, in some respects, is a proxy, and it's not accurate because you can have an African American whose uh, parents are both neurosurgeons. I think the answer is the persistence of the traditional race theory uh, among people who are not uh, biologists or geneticists and know that that traditional view uh, is false. Jim, did you want yes, to Yes, I did actually want to say something on this issue. Uh, let's be very clear that that in some sense, we Americans have evolved our own definition of race. And that's particularly true if you read enough of the history of this country. Uh, race in this country is, was defined because of the institution of slavery. It was, a, it was an easy moniker to decide who would be a slave. And therefore, the accompanying benefits as well as deprivations that accompany that assignment so we have, in, in some sense, we have invented in this country a definition of race. It's, it's perhaps um, not uncommon to see this in societies, but there's a peculiar history of the topic here. All I think scientists can tell you is that we don't see it in biology. We don't see it in anthropology. We don't see what this concept makes sense. However, the social construction of race is very alive in this country, and that's something that we as a people, because the American people have to deal with this issue in a certain way because we made this definition. That's something that we're going to continue to wrestle with and I don't expect to see major changes except that I'm actually an optimist about what this country is capable of doing. Question? I am too and I think having our president will help more than any other one single thing. You're a real optimist. <laughs> Question over here. No, maybe I'm misunderstanding the conversation here. I can think of, right off the top of my head, CCR5, which is the, um, the, the immunologic uh, antigen that is latitude dependent. It only appears on northern Europeans and increases with latitude. And it's, you know, it's the uh, basis for natural immunity to AIDS. That's only, as far as I know, that only occurs in northern Europeans. Yes, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, there are some traits that, uh, are unique in certain populations we don't find them elsewhere. And that's a case of, uh, of a variable uh, having a rather limited geographical distribution in one population and that does occur. Uh, I think we all know um, about the uh, steatopigia uh, among what were formerly called uh, Bushmen Hottentots, now called the San people, mm -hmm. and they speak the San language. Uh, that does not occur in Europe or Asia, as far as we know. It is sporadic in Africa. Uh, so you can find some traits that are limited to certain areas. Not every radiant is going to spread around the world. Uh, but the fact that they are so wide, that some of them are so widespread uh, suggests that this represents contact uh, between people. That contact is probably based primarily on economic factors of trade and exchange of goods and barter and so on. And it's not quite like a sailor having a girl in every port. But in the course of this uh, movement of people across space for economic reasons, there's going to be some gene exchange, right? You're going to have some gene flow. And that may be something that turns out to be very adaptive or it be maladaptive or it may be just Genetic junk doesn't have any role. But the we don't know the distribution of all of these traits. We know the distribution of some. And uh, traits is probably not even a good word. Uh, I would say uh, genetic variables uh, that are represented phenotypically in uh, different amounts in different populations around the world. And some are absent of their populations, for example. Oh, question all the way in the back. Right? Did you have your hand up? Oh, I did. But I uh, well, let me just say I, first of all, enjoyed the panel and it's very pleasing 
personal as well as intellectual standpoint to see on this occasion of the celebration of Darwin's birthday that we can now say that race is scientifically defunct. Uh, and, and I'm pleased by that. I also know it's become quite common now to simply say that race is socially constructed. However, I remember not too long ago, and that's what gave me pause when you called. I was trying to remember the author of this text. Uh, I don't know, Bob, if you can help me with this. It was a big thing on psychology and intelligence. You Bell know where? Curve. You, you have any the Bell Curve. The Bell Curve. Bell curve. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw books being rolled into the campus store on hand dollars at numbers that I had never quite ever seen any book <coughs> roll into the campus store. Uh, so there was this fascination, obviously widespread, about race and intelligence. Are we to take from your discussion this evening that the resistance is over? Not in the least, but I do know one thing for sure. I ordered Herrnstein's book for my classes. I wanted for people to read that book. I wanted for them to analyze that book. And we had one heck of a good time doing it. It was a wonderful book for us to use. And we also used Jensen's 1969 paper. We used a number of these documents in order to see what kind of arguments were being used for hereditary mental differences between races. And those studies were very sadly and deeply flawed, and that's what we looked at by ordering these documents for use in our classes. But I ordered Herrnstein's book for that, ex that use. That explains the 300 copies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, one thing we, we touched on here was uh, the measurement of intelligence in different populations. Well, uh, there is a lot of work to be done on that subject, but one of the uh, earliest ideas of measuring intelligence by a physical characteristic was looking at cranial capacity. Now, cranial capacity is, is the amount in your cranium that's filled up with the brain. Right? And there are various ways of estimating it. You can do it by measurements and formulae, or if you have a skull, you can turn the skull upside down and pour a number eight shot into it, and then put it in a graduated cylinder, and you'll get a reading. All, right, there are all kinds of things you can do. The point is that, and, and I think some psychologists would argue with me here. That's fine. I'll take them on. Uh, the, the, the idea is that the, the larger the cranial capacity, the more intelligent the individual. All right. Well, let's look at, imagine we're in the British Museum of Natural History skeletal basement. It's a fascinating place, and I spent a year down there looking at different populations. Um, it turns out that the range for modern humans is about from 850 cubic centimeters to about 2,000 <coughs> cubic centimeters for brain size. Let's look at some examples. Anatole France, had a, whose skull we, uh, the French have, uh, had a cranial capacity of 1,000 cubic centimeters. Bismarck, who established modern Germany, had twice that. He, it was over 2,000 cubic centimeters. Now, these people were equally intelligent. What's it related to? In fact, I had a, in a class uh, a lovely little uh, Russian lady whose um, husband had been on the faculty here and passed away. And uh, you can take estimates of cranial capacity. It does not involve beheading. And uh, she had a cranial capacity of 750 cubic centimeters. Now, she was a very distinguished artist, and she's also a poet. So, so much for cranial capacity being a measurement of intelligence. What it might be related to, and I think most anthropologists would agree, is total body size. That is, it's allometric. So, smaller body sizes are likely to have lower ranges in cranial capacity uh, than larger, more robust body sizes. But that's a very, very general statement. 
If you want your cranial capacity measured, come to my lab, and I'll be very happy to do it for you. <laughs> Question in the back. Isn't the average of neonatal cranial capacity higher than the modern human? Neanderthals have a higher cranial capacity. Yes. The question was the, the observation that Neanderthals have higher cranial capacities. Yes, that's true. And I think uh, Neanderthals have had very bad press. Because if we know the archaeology associated with them, not only do we see developments in tool making, but also when the upper Paleolithic people come in, Cro-Magnon, if you need a name, uh, the Neanderthals are able to produce the same kind of tools as anatomically modern Homo sapiens. I, don't quote me now. Um, my feeling about Neanderthals is that they, yes, are Homo sapiens, but they're what we call an archaic form of Homo sapiens. Now, there has been a professor at University of Binghamton uh, that has called those skulls, mainly skulls, um, that are uh, pre-Neanderthal in date, or right up to the time of modern humans, uh, he's called them Homo heidelbergensis, because the first specimen was a mandible found in Heidelberg. Okay, that might work fine for Europe. I'm not so sure that specimens that I've seen in India and in China and elsewhere, uh, that term would fit. But it's certainly true uh, that Neanderthals fit into a category of post-homo erectus hominids. And we don't quite know what to do with them because what we find, say in Heidelberg, uh, is very different than what we find uh, in South Africa and very different than uh, what I've worked on in India with a Narmada specimen and so on. So these are perhaps uh, individuals that have evolved from a Homo erectus stock, and for lack of a better term, and I don't like Homo heidelbergensis, although I like the person who coined it, uh, I think it's better just to call them archaic Homo sapiens. Kenneth, what would be the consensus on, on calling Neanderthal separate species versus some sub subspecies, whatever? What would be it the depends current upon consensus? Who I know, but to. if you just took a poll, what would it be right now? Um, I think it would be Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. That's, okay, so that's, that's what I, that was what I was talking about when, as an undergraduate. I couldn't figure out if Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, which, sound, which is technically a subspecies name, but the ornithologists and entomologists call subspecies races, then does that mean that Neanderthal was a race? In, w in which case, I said to my anthropology professor, what color were they? Um, <laughs> And um, and what I, and so I did, and he said, well, you know, that's actually a really he seeing a teaching moment um, sent me to the library to read all the literature that Kenneth was just talking about about subspecies, um, and and my discovery I think below those many years ago taught me one important thing besides some anthropology and evolutionary biology, it taught me that that. The undergraduates, and I was nosy enough to be asking those questions and the, and the, you know, the other students in the class weren't, that the vast majority of undergraduates, even today, do not get or do not know or do not process most of what we've set up here. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm talking about Cornell undergraduates, so the, the, the great unwashed that don't have the benefit of Cornell. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think, and and I think that's one thing that I've already heard several times this week is that it, it came up in the in the Pigliucci talk just a few hours ago that um, what we uh, talk about here on the hill um, is all well and good, but until it actually becomes uh, uh, a term I heard recently, McDonaldified. Um, out there among, uh, uh, or I suppose we could say YouTubed or Facebooked, uh, until it becomes really out there as part of the popular culture, which race is, then um, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you took a poll of Cornell undergraduates or people at the mall about do human races exist, I think I, 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 I suggest that we would not hear what we've heard up here at the, <laughs> at the panel. And that has come up again in, in these other discussions of, of the implications of Darwinism. I expect it'll come up later this week, is that, 
Um, the implications of Darwinism don't matter a damn if people don't know about them. Is there another question? Can I? Uh, I've got Neanderthals older than 165,000 years, or 200,000 yes, years. Right. Significantly older than that. So when you call them a sub-family of Homo sapiens, subspecies, subspecies, uh, please explain that a little bit. I think the the trinomial Neanderthalensis uh, is useful for recognizing what we're all talking about. Now we can use just plain English, a Neanderthal man and woman, all right? But I, I think that what we're uh, using when we use the subspecies Neanderthalensis is, is not a taxonomic category so much as it is a way of recognizing what we're having, what we're looking at. Um, a parallel of that is with Homo erectus in Africa. And um, sometimes the fossils found there are called Homo erectus. But there are other specialists, paleoanthropologists, who say, well, they're not all Homo erectus. There's some that are Homo ergaster. So Homo ergaster would be a different species of uh, Homo erectus. So uh, that's not even dealing at the uh, subspecies level. But there certainly are arguments in any biological situation about what species are. It's not that clear cut. But when you get into the fossils, um, you know, what you can do is uh, have two uh, male and female fossil of the same um, so-called subspecies and uh, put them in the lab and have a candle lighting and some Chopin playing in the background. Are they going to be interfertile? No. You go in your lab the next morning, they're still in the same position where you left them. So this is one problem we have with Neanderthals is whether they're able to interbreed with what we call anatomically modern, whose uh, homo sapiens, whose features are, are quite distinctive in many ways from Neanderthals. Jim? I, yes. I, you know, I, I've been uh, thinking about these questions for a while, even before I knew I was going to be asked to join this panel. And the one thing that I take away from this, this debate is a, a rather simple statement that if we as humans are going to define race, then it should be looked at someplace other than in evolution. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important message that evolution and race has, is that you have to look for a definition that's somehow outside of evolution. One more question? This actually leads a little bit to the question that came up to my mind while listening to today. Um, it, could there be any connection between the denial of special creation, not evolution, but the denial of special creation and abolition, for instance, in Darwin's? period or in Darwin's work at all. Because if you read Darwin, there's, the, the, the conclusion is evolution, but throughout that argument is therefore special creation shouldn't be thought of. And so I was wondering if there was, it was possible in that period that they, the, the theological concept turned, for instance, into an abolitionist concept or thought. And I know that's what occurred to my mind while listening to the panel today. Mm -hmm. Well, I will, I'll just say that, um, I mean, not being an anthropologist, I just know what I read. Um, <laughs> if you read the history of natural science around, just after Darwin, so the 1850s, 1860s, and particularly, because this was when the whole world had, the whole scientific world had to decide, right? It's like, it's like being a geologist in the 1970s. You had to decide if continents moved. And so in the 1860s, biologists had to decide, did evolution happen or not? And we celebrate the, the, the ones that picked the right team, right? And, but there were a bunch of them that picked the wrong team. And so it, it's fascinating to read that literature now and notice that, as, as I think Will said, that you can change the rules of the game and people's opinions don't necessarily change. In other words, people who were not particularly racist by the standards of the day and like evolution weren't particularly uh, racist after they adopted evolution, they, uh, and, and people who were creationists who were abolitionists uh, didn't become uh, more or less abolitionist after evolution, uh, after evolution came along. In other words, it, and maybe this is reinforces what Jim just said, that opinions on race didn't have anything to do with the adoption of evolution just historically. People were racist before and after, regardless of what they thought about evolution, and that's quite striking. Louis Agassiz being the type example of somebody who accepted, who did not accept evolution, but was a vicious racist, and there were other people who were 
um, uh, aggressive abolitionists who were also creationists after Darwin. 